Liar. Everywhere. On NetRootsRadio.com. David Baldwin. Kagra. In the morning. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Tuesday, July 9th, 2024. Time for another show and time for testing out this new setup, the one that I intended to roll out yesterday and uh, was unable to because reasons? I don't know. We were punched in the wrong buttons. Things happened. Anyway, this is supposed to be a fantastic new setup that uh, will help with the editing immensely, thanks to uh, the the production staff, the expanded production staff here at KITM headquarters over the last year or so, which includes uh, specifically college-educated economist-type additions to the uh, to the team here. But I, I bring that up because I was just so impressed with the suggestion that he made yeah, the other day. Uh, my my son, my eldest, the college boy number one, now college graduate number one, who suggested this new setup, and I think I think it not only will make the editing easier and better. I mean, I hope, um, but also I think it cleans up the sound a little bit too. So that's nice. I'm appreciative of that. We uh, and I'm appreciative of getting the thumbs up from. Uh, justice, although, uh, since maybe we, uh, work on the levels a little bit here. So I don't know. I'll keep an eye on those things while we, uh, move on. I think I, yeah, you know what? I think I, uh, don't need the overdrive necessarily on the volume on the microphone. I think I was, I, I set the levels while I had the music up and I was like, this is not enough. People need to hear more voice. Okay. Well, we'll give it a shot. And, uh, one of these, well, eventually I'll find the meter on these things. And then I'll know what the hell's going on. Okay, so plenty to cover today. It is a Tuesday. That gives us sort of the reverse format from the... Uh, oh, I'm much better. Look at that. Put, uh, Justice Putnam uh, lets me know, all the way from the West Coast, by the way, the magic of the Internet, that everything is much better. And so here we go. Now, not everything is much better with the news, however. I was going to say plenty to cover, and we are in the sort of the reverse format, whereas on Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, we have Greg on... First thing as a guest, today is Tuesday, and uh, Greg only has to wake up on Connecticut time, whereas on Tuesdays, and we host Joan McCarter, who has to wake up on uh, West Coast time. Like, well, hmm, that doesn't sound very good, because Justice also has to... Well, Justice is an earlier riser. I don't know. Anyway, the point is that uh, in the last segment, we'll talk with Joan McCarter and check in on, well, all sorts of things. So much has happened since we spoke last, uh, including an additional week to worry about the debate had it happened a week prior to the last time we talked to her. Well, this story is dragging on, as you can see. Many other things to catch up on, though, including, well, this is interesting. Uh, you know, as I've mentioned, Justice gives me little hints about stories he's watching or just that he finds amusing in the mornings. And uh, the first one here, the, why, why this looks... Why this looks just positively silly. Uh, Raw Story reporting that Trump ex Marla Maples, you remember that is, this was the second of the three women that he's married over the course of however many years. Um, and, and of course, not counting all the women that he uh, molested or simply chased around the room, but actually married. Marla Maples suggests that she could be... What? Getting back together with him? Pregnant? Uh, do lots of child support? No. Could be vice president. Because why not? Everybody around Donald Trump is just crazy top to bottom, I guess. But let's find out what she has to say. I mean, I I guess I always considered her to be the least, well, let's say the least crazy of Trump's three wives. Is that meaningful? Uh, Ivana is now the least crazy of the three wives because she's fallen silent. So that's good news. I don't know. Maybe Ivana was less crazy. I, I got no idea. Anyway, this doesn't, uh, this helps shake up the ratings, I guess. Uh, Trump ex Marla Maple suggests she could be VP in first interview in eight years. Wow. Okay. Well, Adam Nichols writes this up for Raw Story. I haven't seen this story anywhere else. Uh, Donald Trump's spurned second wife has, quote, forgiven the ex-president. Ah, he's immune. He's uh, He's gotten a pardon for, I guess, their 
presumably bitter divorce. Uh, okay, she's forgiven the ex-president. There you go. And is revved up to help him win the presidency and even sees herself as a possible vice president. Now, that seems silly. I, I understand the support for him running for president. I mean, not on a political basis, really, but uh, it's presumably better for her daughter, Tiffany, if her father is president of the United States, I, I guess, right? So that's got to be it. Why she should be vice president, I have no idea, but l let's find out. In her first interview in eight years, Marla Maples, who was blamed for the end of Trump's union with his first wife, Ivana, and who was later dumped for Melania, told the UK's Evening Standard she doesn't believe the many allegations against her ex. Well, that's just silly. And she said she's willing to do whatever is needed to help him become president again. I'm ready. I am available if needed. That's one thing. And I'm not sitting back anymore, said Maples, who has a daughter, Tiffany, with Trump. I want to step out more and share more and not be afraid of positive or negative outcomes that come from speaking out. It's time I can really be more on point uh, with what I may be called to do. All right, so far... No hints that I can see uh, that uh, you would be vice president. But when asked, this is, I guess, this is what the UK's evening standard normally does with people. <laughs> would you like to be vice president? Um, I thought we were just doing man and pub interview, but sure. Why not? When asked about potentially being Trump's VP pick, she said, Someone would have to ask my ex-husband about that. I'm open. I'm open to whatever way that I can serve. Right now, everyone in the Trump family is just seeing how we can help. That's just a... All right. So they put it to her, and she just... She didn't say no, but I mean, she should have said no. All right. Well, whatever. Um, is there anything else in here that... Uh, I don't know. Uh, yada, yada, she forgives him, and something, something... But I, all right. So, I mean, she didn't say, like, I should be vice president. I don't know. I, well, I guess that's better than nothing. But, I mean, the answer to are you open to being as vice president is, well, no, I'm, I will help normal ways. There's no world in which it would be helpful for me to be vice president. And it's a silly question. But what if he just asked you, theoretically, would you say... It, sure. If he asked me, I would say yes. If he, although I would probably say you shouldn't be president. But I, you know, okay, she doesn't want to say that because she doesn't want to help. All right, that's very interesting. It's just interesting to look at the way people who are around Trump or were involved at some point in his life look at themselves. That's, I don't know, somehow revealing. But there are many more revealing stories out there to share. Uh, the one that grabbed my attention this morning the Guardian reporting uh, what I guess we all should have imagined and, and partly did imagine already. Uh, Trump plans to block hearings in the January 6th case before the 2024 election. And of course, Trump plans to block everything that could possibly incriminate him or make him look bad. And uh, this is one of them. And post Supreme Court decision regarding immunity it was immediately imaginable that he would seek to have all cases of all kinds, uh, even those already concluded and on the books, against him dismissed because his childlike imagination about what presidential immunity is, is, well, for one thing, is that he can do no wrong and you should let him go uh, any time he does anything. And he believes that the Supreme Court will see it the same way. And so far they have, which is, you know, disturbing and idiotic. Uh, lawyers for the ex-president, the subheader says, are preparing to shut down the possibility of high-profile officials testifying at evidentiary hearings. We, we know he already, well, let's say he's made a, a very specious move to uh, seek to have his uh, convictions in the New York case thrown out. And he's also moving to have all the charges brought by Jack Smith, both before Eileen Cannon and Tanya Chutkin in D.C., dismissed because I have, I have immunity, you know, not looking into under what situations would a president have immunity. And, and why look? Because really, the Supreme Court is just going to grant that immunity 
to Donald Trump, as it's currently comprised, they're just going to say he's immune no matter what. They, they tried to come up with something that sounded like intellectual. Well, for official acts, you'd be immune, which is, well, I mean, I guess it's supposed to sound like a, uh, well, how have we put it in the past? A dumb person's idea of what a smart person sounds like. Oh, there, there's such a thing as official acts and core uh, functions of the presidency for which there has to be immunity. Yeah, if there's a war and you order people to go to another country and kill their army, well, you know, that's not murder because you uh, are the, our commander in chief and you're commanding some armed forces. Whereas if you say shoot someone in the middle of Fifth Avenue, even if you don't lose any voters, you should still be held liable for murder. Unless, of course, now the uh, the super intellectual reasoning from the Supreme Court says, well, if you say that's official in some way, like I shot that guy in the middle of Fifth Avenue because he w was uh, a traitor or he had stolen some national security secrets. Well, those are things that people might actually agree with. But the, the Supreme Court doctrine goes as far as saying basically, well, that guy was going to produce evidence that he claimed showed that I stole the election, but I didn't steal the election. So in order to keep people from becoming confused and uh, chaos ensuing in the nation, I protected the national security by shooting him on his way to the newspaper. He just happened to be in Fifth Avenue at the time. That would probably be acceptable to this Supreme Court. So he is looking to get his uh, New York case at least, or, or, or D.C. case at least, uh, dismissed. Plus, of course, reverse the conviction in the New York case. Uh, so one of the problems with simply getting that dismissed is that, in its wisdom, the Supreme Court has actually, you know, remanded the case to uh, Tanya Chutkin at, with orders that she take this new ruling into account and that she examine each of the charges and the situation surrounding it to see whether or not she can determine uh, whether any of the charged acts could be considered official acts and would therefore enjoy or, or Trump would enjoy the immunity uh, under their ruling for those acts. And really, in order to do that, it, it would probably take a fairly intensive examination of the facts and probably some witness testimony and, of course, uh, oral arguments and briefs to argue both sides in this. So the upshot was, well, maybe, you know, it's not, it's not the greatest outcome, but it might actually lead to having some fairly intensive evidentiary hearings with people testifying to the court, in, you know, in a court of competent jurisdiction, a court of record and everything, uh, what Donald Trump did, knew, tried to do, thought he knew, whatever, uh, about January 6th leading up to it, uh, during the day and afterwards, what the intention was, what he was trying to get done there, and the actions he took to put it all together. And that that in itself would be pretty bad, and it could actually happen before the election, so he's looking to block that from happening. But it has been ordered by the Supreme Court. We They've ordered Judge Chutkin to make this determination. Now, it's up to her how she... Uh, informs herself for this determination. But Trump's lawyers intend to argue that it would be unnecessary and, in fact, probably impermissible somehow for Judge Chutkin to say, yes, I'd like to take testimony from White House officials, top advisors to the Trump administration, people who were involved in the planning of the events of the day uh, and leading up to the events of January 6th, and then hear arguments about uh, what they thought they were doing and why that should or shouldn't be considered an official and therefore immune act. And his lawyers, of course, are saying, no, 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 we plan months and months of litigation uh, to force you to just sort of come to a conclusion based on, well, certainly no testimony. You probably should come to a conclusion based on what we write in our briefs and will appeal to the D.C. Circuit if you rule otherwise. And then whatever they say, we'll appeal that to the Supreme Court and put the ball right back in the hands of the people who invented this idiotic version of presidential immunity. Now, so let me read you the article here and, and continue with commentary of that. Hugo Lowell, whose name we hear all the time, uh, is he is a 
Guardian Washington correspondent, has written this piece. Donald Trump is expected to launch a new legal battle. I can't believe it. To suppress any damaging evidence of, from his 2020 election subversion case from becoming public before the 2024 election, which was kind of the point of, well, elections in general, really. What does this person do? What have they done? What are they likely to do when they're president? I need to know everything I can about him. What doctors are visiting the White House? Uh, That we got to know about. Did this person try to overthrow the United States government and forge electoral college votes? I can't tell you. I'm sorry. You're just going to have to decide based on hair who you want to be the president of the United States. All right. Well, he's, uh, as, as we said, he's launching a new new legal battle to suppress any evidence and uh, preparing to shut down the potency of any mini-trials, as they were calling them, where high-profile officials could testify against him. The plans come after the U.S. Supreme Court last week in its ruling that broadly conferred immunity on former presidents, amazingly enough, former, yes, opened the door for the U.S. District Judge Tanya Chutkin to hold evidentiary hearings, potentially with witnesses, to determine what acts in the indictment can survive. Again, I would have put that, I would have uh, noted for the record that I I, I believe, I don't know, maybe I didn't read this uh, Supreme Court uh, uh, opinion closely enough, but generally speaking, when they remand these cases, they come with orders to determine these things. Uh, it wouldn't necessarily directly order evidentiary hearings. Sometimes I guess they could, but they probably ordered her to make this review. And among the options for doing that would be evidentiary hearings. The other would be uh, additional pleadings and probably some combination of both. Ordinarily, they would probably leave that up to the discretion of the judge, uh, but they may just, you know, direct an answer if pressed for it. The plans come after the U.S. Supreme Court. Oh, yes, I just read that, right? Uh, uh, last week gave this immunity, uh, kicked the thing back to Tanya Chutkin, and she has to determine what acts in the indictment can survive. In the coming months, Trump's lawyers are expected to argue that the judge can decide whether the conduct is immune based on legal arguments alone, negating the need for witnesses or multiple evidentiary hearings, the people said. If prosecutors or if prosecutors with the special counsel, Jack Smith, press for witnesses such as, oh, let's say the guy he tried to get the mob to murder, Vice President Mike Pence, or White House officials who could testify as to what was he doing? Why was he just sitting there watching television when there was an insurrection underway? And why was there no additional security measures being taken at the White House when it was pretty obvious that the... uh, Uh, overthrow of the government was in the balance. No reason. Well, anyway, uh, witnesses like those people, Trump's lawyers are expected to launch a flurry of executive privilege and other measures to block their appearances, the people said. Of course, he's not the president and he doesn't have that executive privilege and that belongs to Joe Biden and he has, generally speaking, refused to uh, invoke it for him. But uh, this Supreme Court... You know, they just invented immunity for former presidents, so why not uh, executive privilege for former presidents as well? Hmm. The plans, which have not been previously reported, though were more or less universally guessed, I would say, are aimed at having the triple effect of burying damaging testimony, making it harder for prosecutors to overcome the presumptive immunity for official acts, and injecting new delay into the case through protracted legal fights. Trump has already been enormously successful in delaying his criminal cases, including by succeeding in having the Supreme Court... uh, Oh, there's, I think, some typo in here. Let's uh, reconstruct it. Included Included by succeeding in having the Supreme Court take the immunity appeal in the 2020 election subversion case in Washington, which was then frozen while the court considered the matter. The delay strategy thus far has been aimed at pushing the cases until after the November election, in the hope that Trump would be reelected and then appoint an attorney general as a, or an attorney general who is a loyalist who would then drop the charges, which is amazing. We need to talk about that. I mean, that's been the background of the whole thing, but I need to 
pause there, I guess, and just say this is a, an amazing thing about the invention of presidential immunity as a doctrine by the Supreme Court. It seems to me like the idea of inventing this doctrine that the, the voters, the people of the United States will grant four years at a time to one special individual elected by the entire country, but also actually elected by the Electoral College, and maybe actually just some forgeries of paperwork that purport to be the Electoral College. And maybe that's even okay. That's one of the big problems with this whole thing, right? But this grant of trust by the people to the president is, well, it, it carries this immunity with it. And it's a, you know, you should be regarding this as a solemn duty, and it should also be regarded as the most solemn rebuke possible if the people of the United States speak with one voice and, well, a million voices, 80 million voices, and revoke that power from you. You can't use residual immunity powers to cling to yet more immunity powers. That's, that sort of bootstrapping cannot be permitted, right? One of the things, if the people grant you this immunity, it is for limited duration and for limited reasons. Otherwise, it's insane and it throws the whole constitutional idea out the window. We establish a king, just as people have been saying for days now. You're making the president into a king. Uh, so, I mean, in, in particular, they ought to take a particularly dim view of using immunity to bootstrap yourself into more immunity. Well, I was the president, so any acts I take to continue being president are official by nature. They are an official exercise of my power and are an official attempt to bring continuity and stability and national security to the nation. Even if, let's say, I've served two terms and I'm constitutionally barred from serving a third, uh, well, the, 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 the uh, situation in the world today is just so unstable, it's really not time to switch horses in midstream. So for national security purposes, I should remain president and I'm immune from prosecution for, for all acts I take in furtherance of this scheme. So as, just as long as I remain president. Well, uh, no, it can't, it can't work like that. It should, the presumption against immunity for uh, taking illegal acts to extend your grip on the immunity pass, I think, should be considered among the highest crimes possible against the nation and should be uh, very strictly scrutinized when you are asking for immunity for anything else. Perhaps you could give much more leeway. But when the grant of immunity is invoked to cover up possible crimes committed in order to retain not only the power of the presidency, but the power of immunity. Uh, yeah, I don't see how you can extract yourself from that situation. So, I don't know. They wrote nothing about that, naturally. Anyway, uh, so the delay strategy, as we have mentioned, has thus far been aimed at pushing the cases until after the November election, when they won't be immunity cases anymore. They'll just be dropped and pardoned, and we don't need any more immunity than that. But now, even if Trump loses, his lawyers have coalesced on a legal strategy that could take months to resolve— depending on how prosecutors choose to approach evidentiary hearings, adding to uh, additional months, adding additional months of anticipated appeals over what Chutkin determines are official acts. A Trump spokesperson declined to comment, saying that they would not preview confidential legal strategy, but everybody can pretty much imagine this is what he's going to do. Trump's lawyers are not expected to make any moves until the start of August. You want a timeline? August. Why? That's when the case is finally returned to the jurisdiction of Chutkin after the conclu conclusion of the Supreme Court's 25-day waiting period and a further week for the judgment to formally be sent down. I guess those papers have to cross town from the Supreme Court to the uh, district court 
room building. Where are they? I don't know. Uh, but also in D.C. So I don't know what the week wait is. But there you have it. I don't know. It's been reported. So there you go. Once Chutkin regains control of the case, lawyers for Trump and for the special counsel have suggested privately that they think she will quickly rule on a number of motions that were briefed before the case was frozen when Trump filed his immunity appeal with the Supreme Court. Back when we didn't think presidents were kings. Remember that? That could include Trump's pending motion to compel more discovery materials from prosecutors. And if Chutkin grants that motion, Trump's lawyers would insist on time to review the new materials before they started sorting through what acts in the indictment were immune, the people said. The Supreme Court's ruling on immunity, the justices, oh, in this ruling, the justices laid out three categories for protection. Core presidential functions that carry absolute immunity, declarations of war, etc., things that are outlined in the Constitution, I would imagine, are among them. Official acts of the presidency that carry presumptive immunity could be overturned. You could show that he doesn't deserve immunity in this particular case. And unofficial acts that carry no immunity, supposedly, if there even is such a thing. Trump's lawyers are expected to argue the maximalist position. Wow. I can't believe that they would do something like that. That would be that they consider all of the charged conduct as Trump acting in his official capacity as president and therefore is presumptively immune for it and incumbent on prosecutors to prove otherwise, the people said. And I, here we're just talking about people who are familiar with the arguments, not the people of the United States of America. Although, you know, they should have some voice in all of this. All right, a little bit more before we take our break here. Um, let's see. Uh, yes, and Trump's lawyers are expected to suggest that even though the Supreme Court contemplated evidentiary hearings to sort through the conduct, they're not necessary, and any disputes can be resolved purely, purely on legal arguments, the people said. That is, after all, their plan for appealing this all the way back to the Supreme Court again. Hi, I'm Scott Anderson, the guy that writes the daily summary for this show, k in the Morning. Thank you to everyone that supports this show. Many of you send donations through PayPal, Patreon, Square Cash, Radio Public, and so on. Some of you write your own essays and send them in, or read articles with your own commentary. We appreciate it. Now, some of you are listening to this and thinking, I'd like to help, but isn't there something I could do that wouldn't require money or effort? Why, yes, there is. You can just like us. On Daily Coast, they call it the recommend button. YouTube has a thumbs up. There are hearts and likes and love buttons. Tap our love button. Tap our love button every day. Share our shows and summaries on Facebook and Twitter, YouTube and iTunes, Stitcher and Amazon. Most of these places allow you to write a review, so a sentence or two would be great. Recommend us to social media or tell your friends to listen to the show. You aren't just helping us, you're helping them find their new favorite thing to listen to. You could change the world. So thank you in advance for me and everybody else in the world. All right, welcome back now to the Go in the Morning Show here on Andrews Radio. Boy, I don't know, this does sound, this does sound really good to me <laughs> in the headphones anyway. All right, so thumbs up for the new design. All of a sudden, uh, my economist is an audio engineer, as it turns out. But uh, after spending some time as a uh, show researcher and uh, now editor, uh, I, I imagine the ideas will start coming. And, you know... Uh, maybe you get a, maybe, maybe a new job in a new direction. Who knows? Anyway, interesting. And uh, lots of thumbs up for the new setup. So I can pass that on. And uh, I don't know, hopefully that will be pleasing to him. Now, now back to the thing which is pleasing to no one, finding out how Trump plans to escape uh, uh, accountability once again. We left off, I guess. Oh, did I scroll back up here? Ah, no, it's just another mention of Mike Pence coming. Okay, I got worried about losing my place here, but now I've actually lost it as uh, we go on. All right, there we are. Trump's lawyers, remember, uh, we were saying we're expected to argue the maximalist position that everything is immune, and they are expected to suggest that, as they say here, even though the Supreme Court contemplated evidentiary hearings, uh, again, We'd have to read the language more closely. It is possible, I suppose, that they didn't order that those 
hearings take place. But they did order that Judge Chutkin make a determination about the nature of the events charged. And yeah, I guess you could put it that way. They must have contemplated uh, the many ways that she could make that determination. One of them, and, and the most obvious would be evidentiary hearings. But Trump's lawyers are expected to say, you can just decide all by yourself without any further evidence, or at least without any further evidence from anybody but us. In our view, we think you can make that decision. And in fact, we will argue that you must make the decision that way if it looks like the decision is going to go any other direction. And we'll appeal that and look to make our way back to this same Supreme Court and say, listen, uh, you asked her to hold uh, hearings to determine whether or not uh, these acts were official. And she screwed up. She said that some of them were unofficial. We need you to overrule her and show why forging electoral college certificates was official and awesome. So please do that. All right. So uh, in doing so, that is to say, Trump's lawyers uh, arguing that uh, the judge can make the determination all by herself in doing so. Trump will try to foreclose witness testimony that could be potentially damaging because it would cause evidence about his efforts to subvert the 2020 election that has polled poorly. <laughs> uh, how do you feel about not having your opinion respected at all? Uh, do you mostly agree? Do you somewhat agree? <laughs> okay. Hmm. Uh, so yes, it has polled poorly, and uh, but this would cause evidence about this poorly polling idea of him subverting the election to be suppressed. And... Legally damaging, that is, this testimony might be legally damaging because it could help, it could rather cause Chutkin to rule against Trump. Trump's lawyers have privately suggested they expect at least some evidentiary hearings to take place, but they are also intent on challenging testimony from people like former President Mike Pence, or Vice President, thank you, Mike Pence, and other high-profile White House officials. Uh, and by the way, this might be a good time to remind everybody uh, Joe Biden is old, and that's it. Actually, that's the New York Times called and said, would you please mention that? But I was going to say, uh, Joe Biden is old. But on the other hand, they say here, well, uh, Trump, uh, what about uh, testimony from people like former Vice President Mike Pence and other high-profile White House officials? Right now, there are two former high-profile former White House officials in prison because... They refuse to tell us what they know about Donald Trump, January 6th, what he did, et cetera, et cetera, because it would condemn him. It would uh, presumably uh, it would incriminate him and it would also reveal that the conditions were right or are right for a finding that these were not official acts covered by the newly invented and newly expanded presidential immunity doctrine from the Supreme Court. This would fall under the type of act that are unofficial and therefore not immune. And what Steve Bannon and Peter Navarro and many others know about it uh, would lead any logical person to that conclusion. And that is why they are preferring to rot in prison for four months. I mean, I don't know how much rotting you can do in prison in just four months. I, well, I mean, not counting uh, Steve Bannon, who entered prison rotting. So I don't know. But Peter Navarro looked like maybe he might be in OK shape. Anyway, uh, yeah, they are in prison right now rather than admit to us what they know truthfully, because if they told the truth about what they know about January 6th and Donald Trump and what he did and how much they helped him do it, then, <coughs> pardon me, they'd, uh, well, they'd all be out of luck. First of all, there would be no immunity. And second of all, uh, Donald Trump would be under arrest and in prison instead of exercising power to, oh, I don't know, smash the administrative state, as Steve Bannon is fairly certain they're going to do. All right. Uh, so where were we with this? Yes, right. Okay. So uh, the Trump lawyers intent on challenging testimony from people like former Vice President Pence or other high-profile officials. For instance, if prosecutors try to call Pence 
or his chief of staff, Mark Short, to testify about meetings where Trump discussed stopping the January 6th certification. Totally official act, of course. Uh, Trump would try to block that testimony by asserting executive privilege and having Pence assert the speech or debate clause protections, even though, well, never mind. Duh to all of that. But, you know, with this court, who knows? Trump's lawyers would argue to Chutkin that any privilege rulings during the investigation that forced them to testify to the grand jury were not binding and the factual record needed to be decided afresh. In other words, you can't use our grand jury testimony because that was given back in the days when people didn't think there was absolute immunity. And now there is absolute immunity, even though there really isn't. And therefore, we would never have spoken to the grand jury at the time because we think that the Supreme Court would have said there's no contempt of court here for refusing to testify to the grand jury because everybody's immune to everything even though that wasn't any part of the ruling. Meanwhile, witnesses such as former Trump lawyer John Eastman or former Trump campaign official Mike Roman would almost certainly be precluded from testifying because they have valid Fifth Amendment concerns of self-incrimination as they have been separately charged with conspiring to overturn the 2020 election results in Fulton County, Georgia, which, you know, ought to be a crime, but uh, I guess no longer is because reasons. So there you go. They really did uh, screw up horribly, but that was their intention. But yeah, a more honest court would certainly have said, at the minimum, one thing we can't have happen is claims of immunity in, uh, as against acts performed to illegally extend your hold on the temporary transfer of immense, enormous power to you by the people of the United States when they have revoked that power, quite obviously. And there should be some presumption of diminishing uh, immunity as the term nears its end. But ordinarily, they wouldn't have to write such a thing because every American president since the beginning, except one whose case is conveniently right before us, uh, has uh, acknowledged and understood the peaceful transition of power is of paramount importance to this whole thing. Only Trump, Trump's the only president so far who doesn't believe that the transfer of power from the people and all of the immunity that goes with it from the people to the president is a temporary situation. He believes it's permanent and might uh, as of right, belong to him now that everyone knows he is president, even for acts taken before assuming the presidency. But for every other instance, every other legal consideration, the date and even time and hour and minute upon which someone assumes the presidency and then leaves the presidency is is absolutely critical in determining what happens next. But somehow... Trump exists outside time now as well. So that's uh, pretty powerful. Hey, everyone can believe that. Okay, so, man, there's an awful lot. Now, there were a couple other things that I meant to try to squeeze in yesterday and didn't get a chance to. So let's uh, update ourselves on this one here. Um, here's a report from over the weekend. Former Trump, oh, we'll open up this way. Uh, hang on here. From the New Republic. Uh, former Trump staffer shares texts revealing secret payoffs. That does sound dramatic, doesn't it? Yeah, well, secret payoffs, uh, the sort of thing that might uh, ordinarily stir some interest during a presidential campaign, you know, or emails. It could be either one, secret payoffs or maybe uh, the potential for bad things to happen with emails, even if they don't happen. Because, you know, emails, that's very important stuff. A new court filing alleges that Donald Trump's campaign has paid to bury a number of lawsuits. These uh, That's impossible to believe. These lawsuits over sexual harassment and discrimination, which, again, is hard to believe because Donald Trump is one of the most notorious predatory perverts in the world. 
Now, ordinarily, you might think that makes it very easy to believe. But I don't know. The, I, the Supreme Court decided that it was not easy to believe for us. And so don't believe it about him. <laughs> I don't know. That could happen any day. Yeah, you're not allowed to believe that, even though. Well, all right. Let's see what's going on here. Uh, it's the case of A.J. Delgado. Remember her? And remember her brief fling with uh, what's his name? The other dude, Jason. Uh, it comes up in here. Uh, for some reason, I'm blanking on his name because he's disgusting and I never want to think about it again. But um, anyway, the name comes up in here and uh, she had the brief fling with the other staffer. Uh, brief fling resulting, of course, in pregnancy. But by the way, uh, oh, yes, Jason Miller. There we are. I was like, Stephen Miller? No, it's not Stephen Miller. I mean, I was like, it's Jason Miller, right? No, that's Miller is the other guy. No, this one's a Miller, too. Uh, and Miller, by the way, uh, like considers doping her with like six different drugs along the way, which is kind of amazing because yada yada war on drugs, uh, law and order party, you know, that whole thing. Plus anti-abortion. Anyway, this is the continuing saga of A.J. Delgado, former staffer on Trump's 2016 campaign, and she shared bombshell texts alleging that the campaign settled multiple gender discrimination and sexual harassment lawsuits. Of course, why not wait until, you know, eight years later to tell people about it, right? The texts, reportedly between Delgado and former Trump lawyer Jenna Ellis, came to light in new filings that Delgado made as part of her ongoing discrimination lawsuit. It takes eight years for people to realize that the leopard ate their face. Uh, th during the first couple of years, you're thinking, I might be granted a leopard of my own that I could release on other people's faces. I might become a leopard, um, whatever it is. I, 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 might, I might have my face eaten by a leopard, but my taxes will be lower. Any sort of excuse to hang on. Well, anyway, what are these texts all about? Well, here's some of them. Jenna, between us, do you know of anyone who complained of gender discrimination, pregnancy discrimination, or sexual harassment in the 2020 campaign? Do you know if the 2020 campaign settled any lawsuits regarding such texts allegedly from Delgado ask? Now, why anybody would answer Delgado's texts, I have no idea, but she does. Yes, off record, Dash Boris. I don't know whether that's supposed to in, in, intimate that it's Boris Epstein, maybe, who's answering her or according to Boris. Yes, this is interesting. But off the record, they say, yes, the campaign settled multiple suits. A text allegedly from Ellis reads. Well, so much for off the record. Have your investigator subpoena Michael Glasner, the texts advise, apparently referring to the Trump 2020 campaign strategist, which... Like, doesn't that lead you to believe that if Jenna Ellis is sending that information to Delgado, shouldn't she be on the outs in Trump world? I mean, I think she kind of is, but maybe more like fall out a window on the outs if she's secretly texting to potential plaintiff A.J. Delgado, this sort of thing. I don't really understand the dynamics here, um, but there you have it. While the Boris named in the text exchange isn't clear... <clears throat> How many Borises really are there? But it isn't clear, but it could be Boris Epstein, strategic advisor for the Trump 2020 campaign. Forbes's Zach Everson noted in an embedded tweet in this piece, while alerting to the filing that Epstein was arrested in 2021 following numerous complaints of groping women at a club. I don't know if I, I, maybe I heard about it in passing, or maybe I heard about it very specifically and clearly, and just tend to forget in the swirl of insane stuff around Trump and Trump world. But what do you know? Another infamous pervert, Boris Epstein, who would have guessed? So that's of note. The text exchange follows, uh, uh, this is interesting. So, may, well, now I'm thinking, hmm, at first, I was thinking, is, is Boris giving the answer? Is Jenna Ellis asking Boris, hey, have we settled any such cases? Which is amazing because Boris would be like, who are you talking to? No, tell them no. But now I'm thinking, is she saying, uh, AJ saying, hey, do, we, do you know of any lawsuits we've settled? And is Jenna Ellis saying, yeah, Boris, 
Like, yes, we settled lawsuits about Boris. I guess that must be it. I didn't realize that the first time I read it. Do you know of any camp that if the campaign settled any lawsuits regarding harassment, discrimination, etc.? Yes, off record, Boris. The campaign settled multiple suits. So that, yeah, now that I'm reading it again, okay, that makes much more sense. So, yes, we did settle some. For instance, we settled the suits about Boris's groping women at a club. The text exchange follows earlier sworn declarations by Delgado, asserting that Trump's 2016 campaign repeatedly used middlemen to send hush money with the direct intention of obscuring discrimination settlements from the public and from the Federal Election Commission. Now, of course, they were caught on one of them, the Stormy Daniels one, and he's now a convicted felon as a result. But same pattern here, that they were obscuring the payments and doing so to hide it all, not only from the public, but from the FEC. And in New York, that's a crime. In other words, the payment would be routed through a middleman to hide the fact that the campaign had settled from the public record and from the FEC, Delgado stated in her earlier sworn court declaration. I thus have uh, direct personal experience with the defendant campaign hiding settlement payments to women, routing them through a middleman law firm, which to the public would only appear as payments for legal services on FEC reports, is what she means. Immediately following the November 2020 election, the Trump campaign paid $4.1 million for legal services, according to the Daily Beast, alongside millions in mysterious legal reimbursements to the campaign's compliance firm, Red Curve Solutions. Now, to be fair, the then president was Pro, and and then re, re, or, or shortly thereafter, former president uh, was uh, looking at some big legal bills, to say the least, for many, many reasons. So I don't know how conclusive that is, but the inclusion of an additional, you know, whatever million of dollars to their campaign compliance firm, Red Curve Solutions. Uh, you don't hear about them appearing in court anywhere, pleading I, either about uh, presidential immunity or... Uh, trying to defend Ken Cheeseborough or anything like that. Uh, so you might have questions about that. Delgado alleged in a 2023 lawsuit that she was raped by former Trump campaign spokesperson Jason Miller, her superior at the time. Miller denied the rape allegations and brushed off her lawsuit as simply intended to harass my family while wasting the judiciary's time and resources. Except for the whole thing about drugging her drink and then raping her and then getting her pregnant and then trying to drug her drink with uh, abortion medication. So, you know, consistency from the Republicans on that one. Uh, well, consistently sex creeps top to bottom, anyway. Plus drug addicts. Anyway... Uh, where were we with this? Right. Delgado's lawsuit claims Miller first attempted to coerce Delgado into sex because of his family, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in October of 2016 by getting her too drunk to consciously consent, which is a great way to have sex with people, oh, totally illegal and uh, highly unethical, after which Miller engaged in a cycle of sexual coercion, rape, sexual assault, abuse, battery, sexual harassment, and sex trafficking, holy moly, to continue their affair. Delgado also claimed she became pregnant by Miller and that on informing the campaign she was pregnant, she was cut off from communications with the campaign. Delgado had earlier alleged to have reason to believe Trump's campaign paid off women who raised complaints of gender discrimination or sexual harassment. And the text exchange allegedly between Delgado and Ellis filed on Thursday appear to bolster that claim. Jessica Denson sued the Trump campaign for workplace harassment. ProPublica notes four other women have filed similar complaints against the 2016 campaign. Of those, Trump's legal team used scorched earth tactics, according to ProPublica, to prevent the discrimination lawsuits from moving forward. 
So there you have it. That's actually the end of that particular piece. And that is rather amazing that uh, once again, with unlimited resources, Donald Trump uh, litigates everything into the dust, even though he should be facing a rap sheet as long as his arm. Except, well, his arm, his arm might be of normal length, but I guess the fingers. So, you know, he gets a break there. His rap sheet is a little shorter than it should be, if you include the fingers. All right. So uh, that seemed important and missing from the record. So I'm glad to update everybody on that one. Uh, let's see. There's definitely a couple of other stories floating around here, uh, some of which are directly uh, impactful on our daily roundup and some of which are just interesting in the periphery. All right. Why not this one? before the break as much as we can and then uh, to keep you on the edge of your seat during our one minute break we'll wait for um, you'll wait for the exciting conclusion at that point oh, okay I gotta open this up in the uh, wacky way again so I don't lose my pocket this from ledgebranch.org which is interesting because it seems judicial in nature but hey uh I assume you're allowed to write about uh, judicial governance in the legislative branch dot org. This from James Walner. This is an older piece from back in 2022. This was being circulated a couple days ago on social media. Do I remember correctly that it was Greg Green that had circulated it? Uh, all right. I'm not certain about that, but perhaps we can check that out. Production staff, you can get on that one. Uh, but this was circulated the other day, I think I said by Greg Green, uh, just in terms of since everyone was uh, in the mood to discuss Supreme Court reform in some way, and we usually go to expansion of the court as uh, the first line of uh, ideas for changing the way the court operates. But there are other ideas out there. And then there's this one, which was very interesting and might perhaps strike people as either more acceptable or more easily implemented than an expansion of the court. Although I have my own thoughts about how interesting that would be or how you might not even have to expand the court necessarily right away, but rather just stack up nominations and have them sit there and wait. But I assume that a, a, a Trump administration would ignore those nominations anyway. But this thinking, judicial sortition is a new concept or a new word anyway for me. But judicial sortition helps Congress and the Supreme Court is the name of this piece. James Walner is your author. Again, it is at ledgebranch, L-E-G branch dot org. And... What is judicial sortition? Of course, when you ask a question with that inflection, you have to answer that it is a limited slip differential that distributes power equally between the two left and right rear tires. But anyway, uh, what it actually is, is something completely different. There are, the piece begins, different ways to win a debate. One of the most common techniques in politics is to make a straw man argument. Okay. I wasn't expecting this, but straw man arguments are prevalent in political debates because they refute opponents without having to engage their ideas directly. Why do that, right? Straw man arguments rely on exaggerated and inaccurate claims to deflect attention away from the opposing view. That is, they succeed by sidestepping constructive debate altogether. However, doing so prevents participants in a debate and its onlookers from gaining a better understanding of the underlying issue and contention. For example, oh my, I guess. So basically the outset of this article is getting angry at somebody that he's debating different ideas about court reform with. <laughs> we should just get to the court reform, but okay, let's see what drama we might need to uncover. For example, consider Matthew J. Frank's response, the immodest proposal of judicial sortition, to my recent proposal to reform the process of picking Supreme Court justices. Okay, so there's a little bit of drama here we got to get through. I didn't realize this. It is a classic example of a straw man argument. In his critique, Frank attempts to deflect attention away from my central claim by misstating my thesis. What is it? While well, distorting my idea and exaggerating the effects of my proposed reform, in the process he conveniently avoids a constructive debate over the merits of my proposal and the need for Supreme Court reform more broadly. 
Okay. Point taken, I guess. I didn't really want to get in the middle of this fight. But now are you going to tell us what Supreme Court sortition is and why you wanted to use it? Under my plan, the Supreme Court's eight associate justice seats would be filled not by people uh, sitting permanently as associate justices, but instead, I'm embellishing a little bit here, instead by a random draw out, uh, not out of the nation's population, but out of the nation's 179 existing circuit court judges, assuming no vacancies. It's an interesting idea, right? In other words, the chief justice, whose job is uh, named in the Constitution might have to be a permanent fixture, and it would probably be best for the administration of the court if there was at least one. But eight other associate justices that doesn't say anything about who they are, or who they have to be, or how many of them there are, or where they should come from, except that the Constitution requires that the judges be uh, for the federal bench in general be selected with the advice and consent of the Senate, right? So in other words, the idea is why nominate a permanently sitting Supreme Court when instead you could say, whether it's every year, every two years, whatever the number of years is, you can take from the Senate approved circuit courts, borrow eight judges to sit as justices. That's actually quite an interesting thing. Again, they're approved by the Senate. What's the problem? You liked them enough to put them on the federal bench. Why do you need to even bother reviewing them again in order to put them here? Besides which, if they're going to rotate out, you shouldn't be all that worried about it. So rather intriguing. Uh, now that we've got the fight out of the way, we can focus on the substance. The judges selected would take a temporary leave of absence from their circuit court duties to serve on the Supreme Court for one year, in his telling of it. At the end of that year, they would return to their respective circuits, and another randomized draw would select new circuit court judges to take their place on the Supreme Court in the following year. That is interesting. And one year should be fine. You right? you sit for a term on the court. They decide all the cases that have been brought to them. And particularly interesting is that the cases would have been selected by the previous court. And that would make for an interesting randomizing effect. All right. Welcome back now to the K-Girl in the Morning Show here on At Roots Radio. So what do you think of this idea? J judicial sortition rotating people off of the uh, courts. And, and I mean, it's not uh, all that far removed from the way circuit courts operate within themselves, too, right? That there are, in some cases, these circuit courts are panels. Uh, well, there are, you know, some, I don't know, a dozen, two dozen, in some cases, I guess, of larger circuits, judges on the circuit and appeals ordinarily are heard by rotating, pan, you know, randomly selected panels of three out of the 16, 20, whatever number there are on the court. And uh, you can, of course, appeal the decision of the three-judge panel and ask for rehearing on bunk where the whole panel has to sit, the whole, you know, court, uh, with all 20 judges or whatever and render their opinions, but it's a relatively rare thing. But the point is they have a pool of judges that are sitting there permanently. They're, you know, they have lifetime appointments to the bench and they're selected for cases as needed in panels of three. And, you know, only in extraordinary circumstances do they all review anything. So you could do the same thing. You could do, uh, people have suggested doing the same thing with the Supreme Court, having a Supreme Court of 20 individuals from which you would select some random, you know, some number that's determined. You could do anything from, you know, three upward. Or if you want, you could have 35 Supreme Court justices and only some random selection of nine sit together to uh, uh, hear any normal cases. Uh, but they could split the casework among them. Or this other idea, which I think strikes me as even more interesting, uh, in that you can, as, as long as you're refreshing, you normally are refreshing the membership of the circuits rather more frequently because there are 179 seats out there. 
So rather more frequently adding new people and a much larger pool to draw from. And if you randomize that, uh, it takes away the advantage of gaming things, for instance, the way conservatives are doing right now. Uh, the Republicans, I should say, rather than conservatives per se, but bringing cases to particularly to these single judge divisions in northern Texas and in Louisiana, which happens all the time and is now getting lots of focus, just like Project 2025. Now that they're denying that, I wonder if they were going to. I never heard of uh, Matthew Kaczmarek. We don't know uh, uh, any judges that do this sort of thing. But uh, if you have the alignment right, you bring it to a single judge division in inside of Texas, which sits inside of the Fifth Circuit, which means you have, you know, a, a direct line to bringing a case, you know, a dream case, sometimes an imaginary case made up top to bottom, the facts and everything top to bottom by conservative activists, bring it to an activist judge who will make a decision and you can get the Fifth Circuit to affirm it. And then pipeline it directly to the Supreme Court where six conservative justices will do something equally stupid with it and you remake law this way. But if it, if there wasn't any way of knowing who was going to be on the Supreme Court when that case got there, that would be, it seems to me, well, it would be a safeguard anyway against uh, the reliable Fifth Circuit pipeline. You know, if if the fifth if the pipeline is topped by a reliably conservative Supreme Court, then you know what's going to happen. If the pipeline is topped by a randomly selected panel from among 179 judges nominated by the last five presidents, well, something different. So it's worth considering, and and it would be difficult to argue against the fairness of it. Not that I couldn't imagine Republicans doing that because it's in their self-interest to do so. So, all right, where do we leave off here? Uh, we described the basics of it, and uh, the author then tells us, my proposed reform is needed because Supreme Court justices have their own opinions. Those opinions make it possible for people to make educated guesses about how the court will decide specific cases in the future. And that incentivizes people to use litigation strategies to achieve their policy goals in the Supreme Court instead of in Congress, which is ordinarily, I guess, the focus of this ledgebranch.org blog. Judicial sortition changes these incentives by making it impossible to know which justices will hear a case in advance. Doing so encourages people to pursue legislative strategies to achieve their policy goals in Congress and the state legislatures, which is, after all, what conservatives always say they want until, of course, they gain control of the courts. And after that, then they say, oh, well, I'd actually rather do it there. Uh, but there's more. Judges are human, it turns out. That's what it says in the, as the title of the next section of the piece. Frank's, oh, we're going to go back to uh, yelling at, at Matthew Frank, apparently. Frank's straw man argument begins. Might as well figure out the controversy here. By asserting that I erroneously claim the support of Federalist Number 10 on the factious behavior that we should expect in political life. But he does not provide any specific evidence to counter my interpretation of James Madison's argument in Federalist 10. For example, Madison writes, The diversity in the faculties of men prevents Americans from having a uniformity of interests. I might have to jump out of this article now. Madison argues that the protection of these faculties is the first object of government. This diversity ensures a division of the society into different interests and parties. Contrary to Frank's assertions, Madison expects factious behavior to exist in society and in government. The regulation of these various and interfering interests forms the principal task of modern legislation and involves the spirit of party and faction in the necessary and ordinary operations of government. I don't know that this is necessarily relevant to uh, explain the, uh, the idea of sortition. But let me just jump down then to this section here that says Congress can enact judicial sortition. I mean, that's true. Congress can. It's worth reminding everybody that you can remake the Supreme Court in its composition without a constitutional amendment 
unless you're amending the job of the chief justice or the the existence of the Supreme Court at all. But all the Constitution has to say is that there should be some Supreme Court and a chief justice and that you can then change the, the size of the court, its mandate, etc., all manageable by standard legislation. It does not require a constitutional amendment to, to accomplish. Franks claims that my proposal is utterly impractical or impracticable without a constitutional amendment, but uh, the author here disagrees and says, no, uh, you can actually do that. A closer look at the historical record clearly demonstrates, he says, that implementing my proposal would not require a constitutional amendment. Congress already has the power to require circuit court judges to serve temporarily in a different capacity as associate justices on the Supreme Court. The Constitution grants Congress the ability to determine the size of the Supreme Court, where it meets, and when it meets. And the Constitution gives Congress the power to create and abolish inferior courts, as well as to determine their size, where they meet, and when they meet. Congress also can determine how all federal courts conduct their proceedings. All true. Congress used these powers to create the federal court system in 1789. Section 1, and, you know, founders, everyone loves them, right? That's as much tradition as you can possibly have. Section 1 of the Judiciary Act in 1789 created five associate justice seats on the Supreme Court, and Sections 3 and 4 created the district and circuit courts, respectively. Section 4 also stipulated that the newly created district court judges and Supreme Court justices had to serve in a different capacity as circuit court judges, requiring them to, quote, ride circuit. That's uh, the terminology for it. It also set the time and place where the circuit courts met. Originally, the circuit courts weren't uh, necessarily entirely separate, uh, uh, constantly existing uh, courts of appeal, but rather were uh, constituted as necessary and uh, were presided over by Supreme Court justices riding circuit, and they actually rode horses back then, and, and would travel within the circuits that were there assigned to them <clears throat> and sit on that court uh, so that there was direct participation from Supreme Court justices in the way the appellate circuit courts conducted their affairs. Uh, you know... Not an illogical structure, but no longer the way we do things. So anyway, Congress later used its power over the federal courts to eliminate the requirement that district court judges and Supreme Court justices serve as circuit court judges. So it came from both ends, by the way. Federal district court judges, trial court judges would be temporarily elevated to sit on appeals courts which is the normal course of things in terms of promotions within the judiciary anyway. And to make sure that, you know, I mean, this is a great way of, of normalizing the effects of the courts, right? Uh, Supreme Court justices who know how their fellow justices tend to work will, would be uh, helpful advisors, I think, in the circuits in uh, advising them how they should approach this appeal. And of course, trial judges who know that uh, they'll have to conduct their trials differently going forward, depending on what the appeals say, also have something to say about that. And they meet in the middle, the appellate courts. That's an interesting way of doing it. We no longer do that. But we once did. And Congress has the power to decide that we might do something like that again. And so therefore could adopt this plan. Congress, as he says here, later used its power to eliminate that requirement. The Judiciary Act of 1801 also abolished one of the associate justice seats on the Supreme Court that Congress had created in 1789. So you can shrink the court, too, by simple legislation. Congress repealed that law, though, a few weeks later, forcing district court judges and Supreme Courts to go back on circuit riding once again. How interesting. District court judges and Supreme Court justices complied with the Congress's directive to ride circuit for 102 years. Congress eventually ended this, uh, repealed its directive in 1891. 
And the Supreme Court upheld Section 4 of the Judiciary Act of 1789 in Stewart versus Laird, just one week after the court refused to comply with Section 13 of the same law in Marbury versus Madison. Justice William Patterson wrote for the court that the justice's prior acquiescence to the riding circuit requirement was a contemporary interpretation of the most forcible nature and that it ought not to be disturbed. Well, okay, we're getting off track here again. But if Congress has the power to require district court judges and Supreme Court justices to serve as circuit court judges, common sense suggests that it can also require circuit court judges to serve as associate justices on the Supreme Court. And Congress does not have to wait before enacting judicial sortition until each and every seat on the federal court's fall vacant, the circuit courts fall vacant, as Frank claims. Oh boy, that Frank. Anyway, uh, well, that is, that's interesting as well. Um, hmm, what have we here? Some other arguments. Uh, during the 102 years in which the district court judges and Supreme Court justices rode circuit, they were nominated only for their seat on the district or Supreme Court but that did not prevent them from being required to ride circuit. For example, President John Adams nominated John Marshall to be chief justice. He did not also nominate Marshall to serve as a circuit court judge, but Marshall served as a circuit court judge anyway at Congress's bidding for the entirety of his career on the Supreme Court. So, very interesting. And then I think some more back and forth between... uh, the two authors who are arguing about the propriety of this plan. But uh, another section later on, unpredictability is everything. I think that uh, argument has already been convincingly made. It would be very helpful in uh, eliminating the pipeline, the biased pipeline, if you did not know who was going to be sitting on the Supreme Court when your case finally made it there, if your case finally made it there. And also would be uh, helpful in, I think, in distributing things randomly and creating more fairness if a random panel of eight associate justices plus a permanent chief were the ones who made the decision one year about what cases would be heard later But they would be able to decide on the basis of, well, this is important as law, as a matter of law, as opposed to I want to be able to rewrite the law in my own way next year. Right. One panel would decide uh, cases pending before it and also make decisions about what cases would come before the court next year when they were not sitting on that court and they didn't know who would be sitting on that court. It does seem like a pretty good way of making sure that you don't have uh, biased justices or uh, judges at any level trying to steer and take complete control from top to bottom of a case and decide it along ideological lines. It makes it practically impossible. Unless, of course... Uh, one or another president was able to flood the judiciary to the extent that they were able to make it practically impossible that democratically, you know, or, or, or judges appointed by a democratic president were even available or they were just flooded out of things. I suppose you got to watch out for that. And uh, if you had a compliant Congress, even under this rule, you could say, all right, well, we're creating 8,000 more Uh, federal judgeships, and we're going to fill all of them with Republican appointees so that the chances of finding a judge appointed by a Democrat on a appeals panel or a Supreme Court panel would become uh, next to nothing. So there you are. Who is James Walner? By the way, James Walner is a senior fellow of the R Street Institute. I don't know anything about it. And member of R Street's Governance Project and Legislative Branch Capacity Working Group. That means next to nothing to me, but the idea is an interesting one. Uh, And then you can go and look up uh, both ledgebranch.org and our street group to see if you can figure out where it's coming from. And, and, And it would be funny if it turns out that this guy is like an arch conservative and poor Matthew J. Frank, who's been savaged here, is in fact quite a progressive uh, in his own. I don't know. I really have no idea who's fighting with whom and why, but it was an interesting 
diversion from the, the main subject. Okay, so now getting towards the end of segment three here, we should be getting ready to talk to Joan. Uh, is there a government shutdown in the offing? We don't know yet. But that's what we always talk to Joan about. And it's a possibility because remember, it is, what, July now. And of course, Congress just back from its July 4th recess. And I guess really what we should be talking about is uh, does bringing Congress and all of the Democrats therein back to D.C. where they can meet face to face and discuss things uh, affect the outcome of the pressure game that had been brought to bear a week earlier on the Biden campaign about whether or not they would have, after all, Joe Biden standing for election as the Democratic nominee for president. Does it change things? Does it, I mean, uh, it, it was imagined that, well, what if they all come back and they all say, yes, we'll stand as one or 200 of us saying we want the ticket topped by someone else? Or will they stand as one in the opposite direction and say, no, no, no. Uh, even though some of us may have different preferences, we think that strategically or ideologically or whatever reason that we just stick with what we've got and proceed from there for various reasons and for various with varying interpretations of sticking with what we got. What does that even mean? Uh, would that settle the question or would it make it less settled? So we can follow up and find out because it's start, starting to look like they're, the, the decision was, uh, well, it's where you think the path of least resistance would lead you. So I guess it would have been predictable whether or not it's the smartest or most strategic or whatever. We don't know, but uh, I think it was probably predictable that the path of least resistance would lead you to, well, let's just stick with what we've done here so far and see how it goes. And is that what bringing members of Congress back to D.C. has yielded? And how long will they be here anyway? Because, of course, August rapidly approaches. And as you know, when with Congress uh, having a work week that starts somewhere around late Tuesday into Wednesday and ends on Thursday... Well, uh, yeah, they're going to be right back out of town pretty soon. August recess is coming. Uh, so that impacts not only the decision about how to approach the presidential election, but also uh, we're reminded, well, after August comes September and at the end of September comes the end of the fiscal year. And oh, my gosh, we're going to be back to talking about uh, possibility of government shutdown again. And Republicans had, for the past couple of years anyway, sort of uh, found that, yeah, yeah, the conventional wisdom that government shutdowns are actually not reflecting badly on Democrats, but reflect instead badly on us, leads them away from that. But now I guess they'll try be trying to pull out all the stops. And uh, maybe if we can crash the economy, we can blame it on Biden and help our nominee in the presidential race. Are they headed in that direction? I don't know. Maybe Joan has some inkling about that. So we'll want to discuss that. We'll want to discuss the impact on who runs and who stands for president as Democrats. And, you know, maybe a couple other random samplings of things she's been interested in. And it looks like she has had an eye on I guess what is the latest dust up, and we just ignored it for the first three quarters of the show, but you all know about it by now. Anyway, it was the hot topic yesterday. A, I don't even know what to tell you. A, a, but, uh, well, she'll know what to tell you. But yes, a, a, what, a neurologist who apparently is a regular at the White House has raised the alarms in the newspapers very responsibly telling everybody, oh, a neurologist has visited the White House more than once. So therefore, all of our weird theories about uh, remotely diagnosing Joe Biden, whether they're correct or not, are now validated because a neurologist, well, something, something, I don't know. And then, of course, as it turns out, this is a neurologist who regularly consults with the White House physician. That would include, by the way, consulting about patients other than the president of the United States. And I guess it finally came to light that uh, this same physician, the neurologist, had uh, visited the White House some 12 times during the Obama administration as well. So, you know, uh, nobody thought that that was evidence of 
uh, of Barack Obama's cognitive decline. And so maybe it has nothing whatsoever to do with this. There are many reasons why someone might. And yes, that you can entangle yourself at any time in any question if you're wrangling over the evidence and what it tends to prove. But it was a big story yesterday. And of course, uh, Republicans had the opportunity to simply do the normal-ish but probably wrong thing, which is to point and say, aha, neurologist, therefore cognitive decline. But instead, they had to go above and beyond. And I'll, uh, yeah, we'll see whether Joan wants to go in that direction. But the latest of her published diaries is quite a whopper in terms of the, the headline. Like, I had not seen that this had been the case. Latest GOP conspiracy theory. Biden's doctor is part of the crime family. Yeah. I, I think maybe <laughs> we'll see if she wants to go there. And if not, if she has more important things to do with her time here, then uh, we'll, we'll just follow her lead on that. And I'll tell you about more about it tomorrow. But of course, it can't just be a doctor. Even It can't even be a doctor saying, you know what, I'm concerned about the president's cognitive abilities. No, there's a crime involved. He's part of the crime family. Sure. All right. Well, we'll check in with her in a couple of minutes and see what she has to say about that and other things, whatever's on her mind this morning. And maybe even a preview of something you'll see on the pages of Daily Coast later on. But before all of the, you know, the the riffraff, I know the insiders here will know about it beforehand. All right. Let's see. A couple of other uh, stories that are lingering that I thought we might share. This is, oh yeah, there's the, there's a lot of non-political stuff that would be of interest for Friday shows. Um, but then a couple of other uh, items that uh, might be worth, uh, why not? Here, how about this as a setup for one of the other subjects that Joan addresses Supreme Court reform and all of the problems that they have. I thought uh, maybe we, can we get this? Can we see the pocket version of it? Or is that not possible? Hmm. Okay, here we go. Um, no, maybe it's not possible. Dang. Oh, right. It's at the Atlantic. But, uh, well, it would have made a nice introduction anyway. But I'm not a subscriber to the Atlantic. And maybe that should change. Uh, and maybe whatever money I'm spending on the New York Times to keep up with some of their good reporting, but uh, of course it supports so many of their bad decisions editorially. I know everybody wants to cancel. I would otherwise have been able to read you Akil Reed Amar's piece in The Atlantic. Something has gone deeply wrong at the Supreme Court. Jurists who preach fidelity to the Constitution are making decisions that flatly contradict our founding fathers or our founders documents, text, and ideals. He doesn't say fathers. Stays away from the gendered language. So, I mean, I think you know that something is deeply wrong, and I bet you know that Joan knows as well. And that's the second most recent of her uh, of her pieces on the front page here. The Supreme Court has gone rogue, and now is the time to start fixing it. So we can discuss and see whether there are any other ideas out there besides sortition or just plain expansion to the number of seats. Uh, but that may cover it. But we should stay up to date on what the options are. Let's see. There is, of course, uh, a, a number of other interesting entries here. Well, let's see. Um, I I guess it being near, near to the break, w something else we haven't yet addressed. Uh, again, just for the headline, perhaps. Um, but this one from the Daily Beast, you, you likely heard about it and, and filed it away already. RFK Jr., right? RFK Jr. reportedly shared photos of nude women. Bad, right? But but not an uncommon thing that people who are, you know, oh, I'm not running for president. I don't have to care about, you know, uh, propriety or morality or consent or anything like that. But, you know, uh, RFK Jr., even if not running for president, he's RFK Jr. And so, wait, OK, but on the other hand, he's a Kennedy and pictures of nude women could happen. Uh, but also a new one, I think, for the annals of history, uh, pictures of a barbecued 
dog. That's what it says. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. shared nude photos of women with his friends and appeared to joke about eating dogs, according to a report, I guess, last Tuesday. I had uh, We had uh, left it for all this time. A lengthy Vanity Fair article delving into the independent presidential candidate's character, and it's always a good idea, also included a woman's harrowing account of allegedly being groped by Kennedy while working for him. Ooh, I'm a little behind on music. Working for him and his family, I guess. Uh, in the late 1990s, Kennedy's campaign re- did not uh, respond to questions about the alleged wrongdoing. While married to his second wife, Mary Richardson, Kennedy was allegedly known to send photos of nude women to his friends, according to the report. Well, that's how you keep friends, I guess. Oh, boy. All right. Well, anyway, uh, bad news. And then, of course, a uh, photo of a barbecued, what looks like a barbecued dog. Gee whiz. Hi, everybody. It's me, David Waldman. Yes, the same guy who interrupts you all the time. Interrupting you one more time. Just to tell you again, another reminder that your contributions are what keep this show on the air and Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com is still among the easiest ways to make the sustaining subscription donations that keep us afloat. Are you ready for the pep talk about how our Patreon campaign is still going strong and growing? Well, too bad. Yeah, the plain fact is we actually are headed in the wrong direction and Whereas we once had about uh, 175 monthly patrons, we're now actually down below 150. Time to recruit some more. Not exactly the kind of news I wanted to share, but there it is. For those of you in a position to support the show, Patreon.com does make it easy to make those secure, recurring monthly contributions to do so. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. We've been through a lot together. The worst of the pandemic, we hope. The worst of the insurrection, we hope. So go ahead and treat yourself. You don't need an excuse. Give yourself the gift of a little something you enjoy in life. Support the show. And of course, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running on those options too. So thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We couldn't, or at least shouldn't, do it without you. Hope you'll be on board soon too. Thanks for all your support. All right. Welcome back now to the Kid Grown and Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Joan McCarter has joined us from the, the, uh, I never really would have, uh, I don't think of Pacific Northwest as sweltering heat, but you get it from time to time and you've got it now. It's a hundred plus degrees the last couple of days. My goodness. This is day five. Well, five. Yeah. Hovering right at about 100. Wow. Upper 90s. Yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, like, you know, that's mm, that's summer for the southeast, of course. But, you know, we've built all our homes with air conditioning. And I guess back in the day when temperatures were normal and the climate was different, <laughs> you uh, didn't necessarily need to have that in houses uh, north of a certain point. And I guess... You were just telling me during the break. Yeah, are you? You're in a place without central AC, and yeah. just it's just you and a bunch of fans. I mean, wherever you go, it's you <laughs> and a bunch of fans. Units. But I see. I see. Okay. Oh, okay. So some window uh, unit AC. So between that and uh, moving the air around the house with the fans, it's got to be. You, you mentioned <laughs> the noise factor. <laughs> Wow. It's just a constant drone in the background that's, bet. that's almost as annoying as the heat. Yeah. But it's working. You know, I'm luckier than a lot of people. I do have these windows. You know? Yeah, okay. So it's just make it sleep a little. Yeah. A little hard to come by. Man, okay. Well, hopefully you get some relief from that. That's uh, I'm supposed to be part of the deal of living tonight. in the north. Okay. It's supposed to break tonight. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Okay, well, hope so. Um, hopefully, life gets back to normal for you there. But yeah, a lot of record temperatures everywhere. You know about this whole climate change thing, which is a huge hoax from China, apparently. Even yeah. though it's a hundred degrees here, somehow they're the, what a hoax! It's been they're very convincing with their hoaxes, <laughs> aren't they? Yeah, and and powerful. Yeah, how they manage to change weather systems globally. Right. Well, you know how it is. In with pursuit of their hoax. Weather control. That's, yeah, right. Part of the hoax is they're convincing us that they can control the weather by controlling the weather. 
Huh. <laughs> Less hoax than threat, <laughs> but, you know, you do you. Anyway, uh, so yes, I've been reviewing. I, I took a look at the last couple of pieces that you had posted, but I, I, I think... Um, in addition to, well, we all know about uh, the Supreme Court being, the rogue Supreme Court being out of control. But I was, I think, surprised, I, I shouldn't have been surprised, that the, the Republicans would make yesterday's stupid press uh, for well, being friends. Well, actually, I have to correct you on that. Oh, okay. It wasn't the Parkinson's doctor. Oh, oh. This uh, is about... I didn't realize it was another doctor. physical exam mm. Dr. Kevin O'Connor gave... Biden in February saying he was okay. He was for a man of 81. He's vigorous, blah, 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 blah. Most healthy ever. That's what this is about. How could he oh. have that debate performance and still and, be? And still be, and healthy. you know, what you said back in February. I see. Okay. And, and it must be because you and James. Biden both have an interest in a company called AmeriCorps that runs what? Uh, rural hospitals. And it's something about Biden, James Biden on the board of this. He got a bunch of money from AmeriCorps, which was supposedly going bankrupt, and then immediately turned around and repaid his loan to his brother. Uh I would say, aha, except I don't understand that no, either. <laughs> and so, wow, Biden crime family. Now, you wrote this piece and uh, already, so you had, had time to read what they had to say, organize your thoughts about it, write it, and still the 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 essential and rundown it's on it is, it's, I don't know, <laughs> there's some kind of a thing where a guy said something. Uh, yeah, all right, it helped it make, uh, oh, I get it. I, now I see, well... It wasn't that the neurologist who visited the White House was part of the crime family. Another Doug, although he may also be. In fact, you know what? He is. And it, it, yeah, that's right. Absolutely true. Yeah, he, this 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 all happened before the neurologist okay. story. Yes. Well, OK. Obviously, so we'll that guy is a criminal, up too. On that. Yeah, yeah. Crime yeah. family for him yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, but this one. OK. So what? All right. I don't even know. But apparently the <laughs> doctor. Uh, yeah. OK. Well, how could he? Why did you say in February that he was healthy if in what month are we in? If it well, the debate was in June. If it in, was June, in June he had a cold or maybe didn't and was terrible in a debate. That's your that's the thing. He couldn't That's be healthy because he had a bad You're debate. You're in on the Biden crime family conspiracy and Got are it. covering up All right. his true health status. And also, there was a lot of money somehow because, yep. you know, why not? Uh, all right, uh, except no, that's not all right. And and honestly, and, it means that, yeah. goodness, the chairman of whatever the stupid committee is, is in cognitive decline and must step aside. Well, we knew that about James yes. Comer already. <laughs> right, and yet no one will call for this. This is unusual, but okay. Uh, just checking in on who's in the crime family and how many crime families there are. There's five, right? So... <laughs> You know, that's a lot of criminals and they're all Biden families. So there you go. The huge Irish mafia. OK, uh, well, that was a surprise anyway, seeing that headline. And now uh, but, the way it was. Yes. And I misinterpreted it. But it was also a surprise to see the headlines from yesterday, which were that, oh, my God, a neurologist who regularly visits the White House to examine any president, I guess, and probably including Trump, except we don't know because they didn't allow visitor logs during the Trump administration, which is astonishing and still true. And we still haven't gotten over it. But and regularly, nobody is still talking about it but us. Yeah. Uh, but this doctor also regularly visited Barack Obama, who, as far as I know, no one has ever accused of being in cognitive decline. But why not? Just to, And he's in a crime family. Go ahead. Yes. So. Uh, the Kenyan crime family. Yes, right, of course, which is the one that's emailing you all the time for asking for your credit cards. So watch out. Uh, I don't know. That was yesterday's frenzy. People will believe anything. And, of course, that does open the opportunity to, to, you know, some media criticism, because in the middle of a campaign where one of the 
candidates as A, a convicted felon, and B, insisting not only was that the right thing to be, but I could be that even more now that I can get out of being charged with anything because the Supreme Court created an imaginary superpower for me and probably not for anybody else. That would be a major consideration in most campaigns, but it's not because a doctor who helps people came to the White House. I don't really get that. Exactly, Pretty much. But, but I think that's Pretty where we much. landed yesterday. So that's the new emails. But his neurologist. Okay. And uh, this is what they I choose to focus on. Today, President, or I'm sorry, <laughs> White House physician hmm. Kevin O'Connor released a letter, a memorandum mm -hmm. about Dr. Kennard's visit to the White House that the White House just sent out. Um, to protect patient privacy for the thousands of patients of the White House Medical Unit and the physicians who treat them normally, we do not disclose the names of the specialists we work with. Hmm. However, in the interest of accuracy, I have obtained permission from the president, Dr. Kennard, to confirm the details. Let's see. He's, yes, he's been there since 2012. Mm -hmm. um, I go through his CV. Um, right as part of president's annual physical he sees the specialist optometry dentistry orthopedics orthopedics for foot and for spine physical therapy neurology sleep medicine cardiology radiology dermatology mm -hmm. and he was the neurological specialist okay well we take pretty good care mm -hmm. of our presidents as it turns out so uh, by the way yeah. that would be a great model for taking care of uh, everybody else in america if you wanted to spend money on it you, you could do that. Indeed. But instead, you know, the rest of us have to pick and choose. Will I have a dentist or will I have a neurologist? Yes. Um, and certainly but, our yeah. annual exams do not include mm. <laughs> all of these people, the teams of specialists. Yeah, the teams exist. They're out there. But, They're... you know, we're also not the leaders of the free world. So Right. Uh, so no immunity for most of us. And no. That they have invented now. Uh, yeah, and I don't know whether that was... I don't know which direction you wanted to go in, but I was... Uh, this is a, a, a... Even in just two posts, <laughs> you can get wrapped up <laughs> forever in all of these things. But what do you well, see? There, there is a bit of fun from yesterday. Yeah. Just, I, I didn't write right. about it yet, and oh, I don't good. know that I will. Well, um, the Freedom Caucus insight. kicked out Warren Davidson. Um, who? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I don't think I know this guy. But he, all right. He was a, a big a member supporter of, of Bob Good's opponent. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, Bob yeah. Good is president of Freedom Caucus. So, so, <laughs> so they kicked mad him. that the Freedom Caucus is having all of this oh, wow. when they're supposed to be focusing on Biden's corrupt doctor. Oh, right. Or, or, and freedom. Just in and case. Freedom. Yeah, that's their caucus. They're supposed to be focusing on freedom. That What it means, of course, is exposing the massive criminal conspiracy of a doctor who takes care of people. Um, but so, I mean, goods out. He lost. And yeah. he's a, you know, he was a big organizer of the, the Freedom Caucus. He's going to be gone. He's and current the, chair of the Freedom Caucus. Yeah. I mean, he still is. And he, he gets to be, I guess, until... If he wants, up until January, beginning of January. But um, yeah, so that's interesting. Uh, again, well, I guess this this explains why, for instance, they believe in things like immunity for Trump, even though he's committing wild, wildly committing crime left and right to hold on to immunity that should not be his anymore after a certain point. I guess it explains a lot to see Bob Good ousted and then using the power he has left as chair of the Freedom Caucus to throw out people who back the guy who's totally going to be in Congress instead of Bob Good <laughs> next year. <laughs> like you could start saying, yeah, I, I'm going to miss you, Bob, but I really I just need to start working on relationship with a guy who is a, a, just as conservative be, yes. or, or more yes. conservative than you, probably going to try to join the Freedom Caucus, to which I guess we'll all say no, because we liked Bob Good. And he'll just, you know, form the Liberty Caucus. And then other idiots just as conservative as him will join that. And then, of course, people will just 
I, I, I'm in both, you know, <laughs> and, and, and then whatever. I mean, that's what happened like the, to the tea party caucus. Does that still exist anymore? I mean, I don't know, but I guess people it who, might. who, if it does, we certainly haven't heard yeah, anything I, about it. I mean, the freedom caucus just cropped up and then I think some people joined both and then people stopped going to the tea party caucus cause it just, it's passe. And then, I don't know. So this can happen, but it's just real interesting. So, you know, next year they'll all forget about Bob Good, but for the time being, they all pretend that they're very loyal to him. And so somebody got kicked out and I never heard of that guy. Davidson got got voted out. Troy Nels, the Texas guy, was so angry that that Davidson from Ohio got kicked out that he resigned. (laughs) <laughs> Although he'll probably come back when Bob Good is gone, I, yeah. or go to the Liberty Caucus that we just made up. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I mean, whatever. But you know, uh, now he can hang out with uh, Murdery Trader Green, right? Uh, who so who got kicked out a long time ago? I'm surprised she yeah. hasn't formed a caucus. But no one wants to be in a caucus. I, that's I the, don't that's think she could get any people yeah. to join. She probably announced, <laughs> "I'm announcing a new caucus." Yeah. Well, so what? Uh, okay. Uh, she was in the news the other day about uh, all of the signers of the Declaration of Independence she was tweeting about who who didn't sign it. Uh, and I, I'm not, I, yeah, I I'm not, somehow missed that. Oh, okay. I'm not certain what the point was supposed to be, which is probably how come we missed it all. But she was talking about the, the ages of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, maybe as a way of saying, look, Biden's so old. But she listed, I think, eight people and uh, six of them had not signed the Declaration of Independence. (laughs) But but the big surprise, I mean, some people would probably be surprised to learn that George Washington didn't sign, but he was busy, you know, fighting the war. He had a lot on. Yeah, Uh, yeah, right. Uh, James Madison, you might think if you weren't paying attention to how old he was at the time of the Constitution, which is the big main story about James Madison, of course, but... If you didn't pay attention, uh, you might not have known that he was like 16 or something when they signed the Declaration (laughs) of Independence. Um, But the surprise entry, Paul Revere, also busy, by the way, at the time. The ride didn't last all year, but, you know, he wasn't in Congress. He was, you know, doing something else. But I had a long list of people who didn't sign, and uh, no one knows what her point was, except that she, like... So many before her, uh, utterly ignorant of the time that they, the time period that they consider to be, they they advertise as their, the the basis of their um, ideology. But well, she has a vaulted company in that. Yeah, six members of the Supreme Court. Yeah, right. Who uh, invent history all the time, and in fact invent factual patterns of cases that they're considering all the time very frequently uh, deciding cases from people who uh, have arrived there aggrieved, but have never actually been asked to do the thing that they object to doing, like making cakes for people or anything of the sort. Yes. Yeah. So a rogue Supreme Court. And of course, the whole idea of, you know, president is king. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, That that was totally, totally what the founders were thinking. That happened. Yes, right. Yeah, that was uh, definitely on their minds um, that, you know, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary to get a different king, you can just do that. Yes. I think that made the declaration much simpler, easier to read <laughs> uh, and to sign as well. In case you're busy fighting a war, you don't have to spend a long time reading this document. We'll just fax it to you. You uh, at the airport, which you just took over and... Uh, <laughs> You can you can sign it. So uh, with the Supreme Court having gone rogue and now being the time to start fixing it, a- any interesting uh, new developments in how to fix it? Uh, we still uh, I just read an interesting th- idea about judicial sortition, uh, borrowing temporarily uh, sub- uh, or uh, uh, circuit court judges to sit as associate justices in for a year for one term rather than naming permanent lifetime associate justices instead that sounded interesting i like that idea a lot yeah i'm kind of warm into that 
as long as you can keep out the fifth. Uh, <laughs> that's not fair. <laughs> yeah, right. But yeah, I'm sure as part of the randomization, you might say, well, okay, no more than two from any single circuit at any given time or something like that. Yes, uh, I think that would be the safe way to do it. I think that's a really interesting idea. Hmm. And I think it would probably be helpful for the circuits as well. Yeah. To have this sort of sense of the enormity of what they can be doing. I, yeah. I just think it would be a good perspective for circuit court justices or judges rather to have. Yeah. Um, I think, right. You know, it would give them, and, and of course, um, well, you wouldn't be naming people to the Supreme Court anymore, but I suppose the next chief justice could come into the job with some experience on the court, even if they're, you know, they're not always promoted from the associate justice to, to you know, to, to to the chief judge. They sometimes, this is their first, they land in the chief job. That as, actually as happens fairly frequently. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that might be helpful if they had a chance to sit on the court. And of course, the randomizing nature of things eliminates this uh, ridiculous single judge division through Fifth Circuit directly to right. Supreme Court pipeline that has been exploited immediately and to great effect by Republicans and can't possibly have been the uh, contemplated design of the thing from the beginning. So they don't understand how the presidency was designed. They don't understand how the courts are designed, but they're engineering them to be this way nonetheless. And super dangerous, obviously. Super dangerous. Are there other ideas beyond that? Other and... ideas, term limits for ah, them. Yeah, yeah. That they okay. should not be lifetime appointments, sure. which I think is also probably a pretty good idea. Yeah. Um, a, a rotating effect. It's sort of like the certation where um, each president gets two appointments. Hmm. Oh, everybody gets, and, okay. And with term limits, you know, people fall off, mm -hmm. come on, but every president gets to do two. Okay. There's also just simple court expansion. Um, mm -hmm. Right. But, which I like, I think is necessary. It's the immediate fix. Yeah. I don't know that it's the sole fix. Because, of course, if a good president, like President Biden... Uh -huh gets to pack the court, then uh, Donald Trump could repack it. Yes. He's already done. Mm -hmm. So I, packing, I think, needs to come with some of the other reforms. Expanding the court, yes, definitely. And, and while you're at it, you need to add some district and circuit court positions because they are, there's the problem of, of course, blue slips and mm -hmm. judges not being appointed. But there's yeah. just a big problem of the caseload overtaking the numbers of, of judges we've got out there. Yeah. So really from the bottom up, we need to be working on some reforms. Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, uh, I, I guess with the election coming, there aren't any that have the momentum, you know, to actually be considered prior to the election. I, so the next Congress will be solving these things, but you have to start floating them. Now. There aren't, but you know, we need to start making the case and yes. we also should be making the case that Samuel Alito and, <laughs> yeah. and Clarence Thomas should be impeached. Yeah. The house is all there. Durbin is of course not. Hmm. Um, it would be very helpful at this point if there were some high profile hearings about corruption on the Supreme Court in the Senate Judiciary Committee. Yeah. And in my opinion. I yeah, you can see why. Obviously the stories are, are well known. And you can see, I mean, knowing what we know about Durbin, of course, it was easy enough to predict. Uh, unless you have a you know, a path to either if not certain a certain outcome, then at least a fighting chance to get somewhere with removal, Durbin's usually gonna say as always, well, we don't have the votes. That's a very frequent refrain yeah. for him. Uh, although it is a, a good time then to bring that up in the, it reminds us of, 
previous contexts. We don't have the votes on filibuster reform, et cetera, et cetera. And just in terms of, well, okay, if we're going to have this long slog of a fight for court reform, I'll remind everybody, it was about five years from, yes, that's adorable, but that's not how filibuster reform and Senate rules reform works, to, oh, yes, it is, and we've just done it. So yeah. five years is not a lot. A presidential Thank term. Thank you, Harry Reid. Yeah. So, you know, uh, these things happen and they don't necessarily take a lifetime. It's something that you could begin organizing for and see happen uh, inside of the time that it takes, right, either to complete a presidential term, uh, put one of your kids through college, you know, if, if, as they're, if they're as high school seniors, you begin organizing for this, uh, make a nice graduation present when you finally graduate from college, or maybe, hey, take a fifth year and see what else we can get accomplished in that time. It, it doesn't take forever. It's not an impossible dream. It's not uh, just something to be dismissed. Right from the beginning, the filibuster reform effort was, no, it really doesn't work that way. You don't understand. Well, guess what? It is happening that way. Just as described, you didn't understand. Yeah. So, all yes. right. You uh, didn't have enough imagination. Yeah. And uh, even, well, you know, even people who were sort of institutionally opposed to it. Uh, Dick Durbin didn't go anywhere during the middle of that. He started out saying, no, it doesn't work that way. And said, I can see that my colleagues think it does and I will help. Even Dick Turbin can be convinced. Even Dick Turbin. <laughs> yeah. Just got to move the entirety of the rest of the Democratic Senate caucus. And, and then he'll say, ah, I see. The bus is headed this way. Here I go. <laughs> I was always for that. So, all right. Uh, and of course, while we're at it, we should also just yes. dispense with the Senate. But you know, <laughs> yeah. Although that's really hard to get Senate votes for. Yeah, I don't think we're going to get the Senate to agree to that one. <laughs> right, but you know, stranger things have happened. Uh, it, it's been a while, but I mean, I, the originalists among us say, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, we somehow got the, a constitution ratified and in place that eliminated the then existing Continental Congress. But that was because we didn't invite any of them to the right. <laughs> convention. So, you know, that wouldn't fly now. But no, uh, a proportionally representative Senate. Yeah. Except, of course, they hate the House and they don't want to look like the House. Oh, right. We don't want to turn them into the House. That's right. Yeah, definitely true. Yeah. Unless we do, which we do. Which so. we do. Uh, but aside from that, uh, and uh, I think it's probably, I, I did warn everybody, uh, fans of discussion of government shutdowns, it's still too early, but it is almost it's August still recess. too early, but, you know, we've got the creeping, <laughs> yeah. the, the elements are being set for it in the appropriations bills that the House has passed yeah. that the Senate will in no way agree to. Right. So we're going to have that difficulty and it is almost time having just returned from recess. It is, of course, almost time to go on recess, which, yes. you know, a uh, big recess. Yeah. The August. So, I mean, whatever happens between now and uh, the next two weeks is going to be frozen in place until a 30 day countdown mid election season race to the finish to fund the government. Awesome. Also a good design. Something to reconsider, perhaps, but courts first. Courts uh, first. Anything um, else? Because that, uh, it's messy and it's unpleasant and it's yeah. difficult, but we do usually end up with a funded government. Yes. And that will take care of itself. And it's not a not frequently made a uh, campaign theme, although uh, certainly if it's like if, if you're running the government on uh, CRs and fighting every day on the floor of Congress, they and, and they won't want to do that either. Even Republicans won't want to do that because they'll want to be on the campaign trail and not uh, treating caucus members well because they, they well, always do. They're crazy and they don't particularly care That's about true. having a majority. Right. <laughs> But uh, they also don't care about having members in the Freedom Caucus either. Yeah, so, apparently not. Yeah, no. I don't know how many of them are going to be there. Uh, and uh, although it would be interesting, to, Bob Good will have no campaign to take care of. 
in he that will not time indeed. period. He, he, he can root all he wants for a government shutdown. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's true. I hadn't thought about it that way until just, just now, as you reminded me. Uh, and of course, members back in town now, I was wondering how that might impact the debate over uh, what will we, I guess the debate now is narrowed down to what will we say about Joe Biden? Not what will we do about Joe Biden? What will we say? About what Joe will Biden? we say about, there's still a lot of mewling around Mark Warner. I don't know what his point is, but he's very annoying. The Congressional Black Caucus. Ah. Um, Steve Hosford is the chair, came out yesterday and said, this is bullshit. Yes, ah. we're with President Biden. And then Biden had the meeting with the CBC afterward, which I have not seen the reports out of yet. But, you know, when you've got the Congressional Black Caucus saying, hey, people, yeah, stop it. Um, that's that's significant. It is, and they're powerful enough. And, and of course, coming out like that, uh, anybody is going to take pause and say, well, am I going to oppose the whole Congressional Black Caucus? And it's, I, I may have a point, and yet I'm beginning to realize that, uh, you know, strategically it's just going to become difficult for me to continue to make it. All right. Yes. Well... That uh, that a new development with members back in town. You figured they would be able to resolve this uh, a, a little easier with everybody in the same area, if not. Well, even though, you know, Skype and Zoom made it possible for you to discuss this beforehand. But, uh, yeah, with everybody back in town, they'll be consolidating their positions. And it's starting to look for all the world like, uh, all right, you know path of least resistance what do you know turns out to well be, reality is setting yeah. you know do we don't have time to do otherwise yeah uh, right if you think you had time to fix the budget or reform the supreme court before the election probably not and uh, even less time to decide who the candidate is going to be yes. okay well interesting developments and uh, i learned the name of a new freedom caucus member who's not a freedom caucus member so <laughs> i appreciate it thank you joan We'll check in with you again next week. Stay cool if you can. From NetWordsRadio.com You have been listening to KGRO in the morning with David Waldman. Yes, and thank you to Joan McCarter for coming in and visiting with us. Time now, though, to hand things over to Justice Putnam for the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. He's prepared to take you through the next hour with a collection of stories, including Trump's unwritten deal with the media which was exposed by the hyenas of the White House press corps yesterday. What's that about? Stay tuned.